All right. Welcome back, everyone. The recording has started. I hope uh, those who may have accidentally been removed from the call can join back. All right. So we were talking about the miracle that took place at Gate Beautiful, where a lame man was very obviously healed. Uh, in this case, <laughs> excuse me. It's uh, great to note that the miracle was so very real that people took notice of it and they wondered if it was really the man who, who they saw sitting at the gate. And uh, you know, Peter begins to preach. I just said that he made a connection between the God whom the Jews worship and the Lord Jesus. But initially, it sounds more like uh, he's trying to blame them. However, he's really calling them to repentance because uh, they did not accept this Jesus whom uh, God sent. And that is why he's calling them to repentance. Now, to uh, help them understand further, uh, he, he says, he refers to Moses. Okay? We know that Moses uh, uh, truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things. Whatever he says, you do. This to you. And uh, it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So what is Peter trying to do? You know, this is all um, uh, homiletics when we talk about preaching. Uh, there are so many points we can notice over here. Firstly, taking the opportunity, he sees the right moment to preach and he preaches. He uh, looks at how he can talk about Jesus. So he is using the miracle as that subject through which he can initiate uh, introducing the Lord Jesus. Then he goes on to explaining who Jesus is. But look at the way in which he does it. He spoke of the familiar uh, people that the Jews know about, uh, Abraham and uh, uh, you know Jacob. Now he's talking about Moses because they will get it in terms of uh, what the early fathers had said. And uh, it's truly the Lord Jesus fulfilling those words that were spoken. So right now, he had mentioned saying Moses talked about the prophet. Uh, and we need to believe that prophet. Who is that prophet? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, he says, uh, all the prophets from Samuel, you see? in context because he is trying to get the attention of the Jews. So it's sounding very uh, scriptural because that's when they are going to respond. Uh, it's like, you know, the various versions of the Bible as well that, you know, we may, we may refer to. Like if the people are uh, those who understand the old KJV version, then, you know, we may use that version. But if it's uh, a crowd that understands the simpler uh, version of the Bible, we may use that, but then uh, present the truth accurately, just so the audience gets the understanding of what is being spoken. So it's contextualizing, basically. So that's what he's trying to do in this case. He's bringing up all these names, uh, and he's saying the prophet that all these men of God were referring to you is the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has said this Jesus, God has erased this Jesus, and uh, he has sent him to bless you. Okay. And uh, in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Remember how he had mentioned about repentance earlier? And he said, times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord when you repent. So using that miracle, using that incident to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's move on and see what really happens in Acts chapter 4. So we are expecting a good outcome out of this because you know this is a great miracle that has taken place but now the response of the people will be recorded for us let's see what happens uh, can someone please go ahead and uh, read from verse one to four and then another person can be ready so that they can read the next set of scriptures so we'll start with verses one to four 
Now, as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Amen. Yes, thank you, Roslyn. So what we have seen now um, is the response of the authorities who heard about the miracle and the preaching of uh, Peter. So there are some people listed out there, the captain of the temple, then there is the mention of priests, um, there is the mention of Sadducees. Who are all these people and why are they together? It's almost like the police force of the, those times. That is why uh, it, it's like that team of uh, uh, vigilance, they were upset by what was going on. And uh, quite likely so, because they were threatened. Uh, they knew that Peter was preaching the Lord Jesus, and he preached resurrection in Jesus from the dead. Now, part of the police force are the Sadducees. We know that they don't really believe in the resurrection of the dead. So it was problematic for them you know, theologically and politically uh, to speak the message of Jesus, which is why they were disturbed. How disturbed were they? They were disturbed to the point of, uh, it says, they laid hands on them. That is nothing but seizing them or catching them. So they caught them and put them in custody until the next day. So basically what they are uh, uh, sort of anticipating is a rising rebellion of some sort through, led by Peter, John, and you know maybe the believers, because they would have felt that here are the disciples of Jesus. Now, we don't know where he his body uh, disappeared, but his men have come to cause trouble. And with that in mind, for their own safety, they felt that it is good to just put them in custody. So they could have arrested them the next day, but they did not want this situation to escalate. So they catch them, put them in custody uh, until the next day, it says. What is the meaning of that? They had some procedures. They had a process. So they could not try them in the evening. And they just had to wait for the courts to open the next day morning so that uh, they can uh, go through the actual steps of convicting them. Now, what is going on may not have been what Peter and John expected. Now, we don't know what Peter and John were thinking in their minds that, wow, what a miracle God has done. We give God the glory. Uh, we talk about the Lord Jesus. We invite people to repent. The church now is going to thrive. The work of God is going to expand and increase. Maybe they were just uh, joyful in anticipation of the work of God. But here comes opposition. Here comes uh, persecution. So we don't know if they've caught off guard or if they were mentally prepared to face persecution. But unfortunately, you know, sometimes we may go from uh, a place of ministering so powerfully and thinking that you know people are going to respond positively to this message straight into finding opposition and we are like what just happened we thought uh, for a miracle like this everyone will fall on their knees and you know repent and there'll be a revival in the land and here are the people standing and opposing Peter and John. However, the greatness of our God is that in the book of Acts, even when we see opposition, the next thing that you will read is the church is growing, the church is growing, the church is thriving. Okay, So this is not the only place. Even later, we will notice that God's work could not be stopped. They may be the opposers were uh, successful in stopping a few men here and there, but 
the work by the spirit of god continued in the hearts of people and the church only kept thriving so notice that last uh, section verse 4 it says however many of those who heard the word believed and the number of the men came to be about 5000 so since the first day that the church started now luke doesn't give us you know uh, how many days it has been or weeks it has been but at this point 5000 is the attendance okay so like church uh, we usually say oh how big is the church now church is 5000 god's work is continuing even in the face of persecution and that's what we observe here so the book of acts is a, a period of great opposition uh, even today we find opposition in uh, places around us uh, maybe the places where we are from but the lesson we learn from the book of acts is that even these things cannot really stop you know what god wants to do here on the earth so yes peter and john are in custody but the church has now grown to 5000 people okay let's read further and see what else we have in store here let's read from verse 5 all the way till verse 12 I request another person to go ahead and read. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, "By what power or by what name have you done this?" then peter filled with the holy spirit said to them rulers of the people and elders of israel if this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well let it be known to you all and to all the people of israel that by the name of jesus christ of nazareth whom you crucified whom god raised from the dead by him this man stands here before you whole This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Thank you, John. So uh, here we find the next day. trial is taking place there are the rulers elders scribes uh, as well as annas the high priest caiphas john alexander so these are all the names uh, that they had in that council um, and what are they doing okay they are questioning peter and john who is peter what is his profession any idea what was peter's profession was a, was a fisherman right okay and we also saw how uh, galileans were looked down upon so it's a very interesting scene you have the who's who of the uh, of jerusalem all gathered together and they are threatened by a fisherman and his friend but why Now, what is this big threat? Because they felt, as I stated earlier, a political threat, a religious threat. Um, uh, maybe even culturally, they felt that these guys are trying to uh, completely turn the hearts of people towards this Jesus of Nazareth, because of whom we already had a lot of problem, you know, uh, uh, some year, some time ago, and. Uh, here come his representatives to create more chaos and they were afraid that they may lose their positions of authority so it could have been a you know a a, a, a community a, a reason a collective reason but it could have also been a personal reason because they did not want to let go of their authority so they questioned peter and john and they asked them directly by what 
power or by what name have you done this? In other words, who gives you authority to heal this man? And Peter is shocked. He is, uh, you know, going ahead and giving a response to this question. And think about this with me. The scene is like all the big people of the city are there, and Peter is uneducated. Uh, you know, he's standing before these big people. We would imagine that as he is being intimidated, he will be scared to even open his mouth or be uh, eloquent about his thoughts. But no, he's so bold. What made him bold? Luke writes at the beginning of verse 8, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. That made all the difference. The boldness came because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he speaks, he gives an answer to the rulers. Uh, and he kind of, uh, you know, he um, asks them a, a very direct question. He says, uh, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well? So he feels that it's so funny that they're even asking this question. Uh, he did a good deed. But he's arrested for it. But he goes ahead and he explains to them without holding anything back. He says, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We can imagine the boldness. Now, uh, we don't know what the crowds these days, like, you know, if you watch a movie or something, there's always a response of the crowd, whether they're all very quiet or they go, oh, because he is saying a name which can get him into more trouble. He's already been in jail overnight. Peter, don't you want to go back home? Why are you putting yourself into more trouble? He's saying, how can you even ask me about helping a, 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 you know, a lame man? I did a good deed. OK, if you want to know, let me tell you, I did it by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And if that was not enough, he's saying, whom you crucified. OK, so it's just getting uh, a little more, uh, you know, sort of fiery. Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Now, these points that he's making would have challenged the rulers even more. Because what is he saying to them? You have the priest, the high priest, all of them there. He's trying to tell them that Jesus is the Messiah. And then he says, God raised from the dead. That can create trouble because the Sadducees are listening and they don't like to hear about resurrection of the dead. He's not worried about anything. He's just speaking the truth of God's word. And he's saying, by him, this man stands here before you. Hold. Who asked the question? I'm giving you the answer. Okay. And uh, he goes on. This is the stone which you which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So he's quoting uh, a scripture also by which they will understand that he is referring to the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, and then he says, nor is there salvation in any other, but there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So he is not saying Jesus could be the way, Jesus might be the way, he's one of the ways. Very direct response. Jesus is the only way. Salvation is found in no other name, but there's no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. How could Peter be so bold? Verse 8, Luke said, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit gives them a direct answer to their question. Now, let us see what happens. Okay, So this whole court scene is going on. Uh, they, Peter and John are being intimidated, but Peter is responding very boldly. What happens next? So uh, could somebody help us read from verse 13 till 22? Acts chapter 4, verse 13 to 22. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as man who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who 
who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We can't stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then kept in them, further but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot for everyone was praising god for this miraculous sign the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years thank you thank you Jacqueline. so uh we see that after the response of peter the council was very confused because there is definitely proof that a notable miracle has taken place this man whom they all knew who used to sit at the gate of beautiful is now able to walk and uh, it's a definite miracle so they cannot speak any they cannot do anything to peter and john uh, because it'll upset one section of the people. So they are wondering, what do we do to these men? And then they will come up, come to the conclusion that they will just warn them, right? So they warn them and they tell them, uh, okay, do one thing. Don't ever speak in the name of Jesus. Go back, but don't speak to any man in this name, the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, so when they commanded in this way, what was the response that uh, Peter and John had? They say, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. So now again, another question arises. The authorities are saying something. We are supposed to respect the law of the land, right? But what is it that Peter and John are uh, responding with? They are saying that, no. What we are being asked to do is to deny God and God's power uh, and to not speak in the name of Jesus, which is not possible because that is who, that is what their faith is all about. And so when the authorities are telling them something against their faith, they stand up for themselves and they say, you decide whether it is right uh, uh, in the sight of God to listen to you or, or to listen to God. Or in other words, they say that we'll have to do what God is calling us to do. We cannot uh, you know, do what you're telling us to do. So that again is a very, very bold way of responding. Uh, and they say, but we cannot speak the things which we have, cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So they are clearly proclaiming to the council that you can't stop us. We will continue to do what we are doing but these uh the council couldn't do anything because of the nature of the miracle and they had to let them go and notice how uh this passage also said that peter and john were uneducated right and uh, they were not any kind of uh trained men but what was the difference they were with Jesus. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. These are all the reasons why they gained that boldness which they carried when they spoke to the council. Now, let's go ahead and read the next section here. <coughs> let's uh, read from verse 23 to 31. Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 31. As soon as they were free, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had heard. 
When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voice together in prayer to God, O Sovereign Lord, Creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plants? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, whom his pilot, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. Many may miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. All right, so <clears throat> as we continue in, uh, you know, what is really happening, Peter and John were let go, and we imagine you know, what uh, exactly they would go back and tell their uh, church congregation. They go, they report, it says, to their own companions, um, all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So basically, they present a report. And then they started to pray. Remember, we saw that this was a praying church. The early church is a praying church. So their first response is praying and praying together. That's so beautiful. Uh, when they're going through, when they're waiting upon the promise of the Lord, they're praying. When they have to make a decision, they pray. And now, when they're going through a rough situation, they have chosen to pray. So they raise their voice to God with one accord. Remember that term, one accord? It's oneness of heart, oneness of purpose. They come together and they start to pray. What do they say? They just state some of the uh, uh, scriptures and uh, they talk about who God is and how it is the Lord whose ultimate purpose will prevail, even though there is opposition coming through leaders and nations and kings and rulers. Uh, can anyone stand against our Lord? So, you know, they go ahead and uh, just proclaim the truth. They declare the truth that they know that no one can rise above God and know that God is the ultimate authority. And then they, uh, in their prayer, they exalt Jesus. They say, your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. Okay? And then what happened to Jesus, uh, the way in which he was, uh, he was crucified. Okay? They talk about all these things. They just make declarations of these things. And they make a declaration that God, no matter what happens, it is your purpose that prevails. Their confession at a difficult time is God's greatness and the truth of God's word, which says that the purpose of God will prevail. And along with the declarations, what do they do? They say that, uh, you know, yes, these uh, council members are threatening us, but make us bolder. Now, this is the part where some of us may be surprised. We expect the disciples to only pray a prayer of protection because that is how we think, or at least I think. If I'm going through some opposition, <clears throat> the first thing I would say is, God, protect me, protect my family, protect my church, which is not a wrong prayer. It's a good prayer to pray. But notice the points of the early church. Additionally, maybe they even prayed for protection, but what? Luke has chosen to mention here is, he says, God, give us boldness. And they also ask God that he would do more signs. 
he would do more wonders and when you know hands are stretched out to heal that healings would take place so grant to your servants is more like uh, you could say maybe the focus was on the apostles that now that john and peter have faced this difficult situation that these people along with the other leaders should move in mighty signs and wonders and boldness no matter what one miracle has taken place and uh, you know these uh, hearts are still hard let many more miracles take place so that people will know who god is and uh, his name will be glorified so it was a really bold church filled with the holy spirit where their response is so commendable uh, they declared that even rulers or nations uh, kings authorities cannot override the purposes of god that was their declaration and the second thing they say is god give us boldness increase your work lord uh, by stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant jesus meaning they are saying god you do more okay so what will this lead to more trouble but they are not afraid and uh, it's almost like you know god gave them a supernatural experience to reveal his pleasure i don't know you know what was the reason that verse 31 is recorded by luke but luke says and when they had prayed the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the holy spirit and they spoke the word of god with boldness so uh, something tangible happened in those moments when they had prayed this prayer it says that the like the place where they stood shook so it it would have happened like uh, you know natural occurrence no wonder this has been recorded now <clears throat> some commentaries have this uh, reference to a particular earthquake that took place in uh, northridge at 4:31 in the morning okay so and they say oh it it refers to acts chapter 4 and verse 31 where the scriptures say that the earth or the place where they stood shook but it's god's doing you know when god wants to manifest his presence in a certain unique way it can happen uh, and i have heard testimonies of uh, when people are praying uh, some physical manifestations of uh, you know god's presence like in this case it's the earth shaking in some cases there's a mighty wind so many things happen and it's up to the lord we cannot expect such things to take place every time but there are times that these things can happen uh i don't know how many of you have watched uh, there is a particular south african minister an elderly man uh the quite uh, respected and uh, in one meeting where he was preaching about the power of the holy spirit and the anointing of the holy spirit he goes to acts 2 and he starts preaching about that you know uh, rushing mighty wind and suddenly right the rush of rushing mighty wind and the atmosphere was so calm and suddenly there's a rushing mighty wind to the point where his mic is also not standing you know everything is shaking and somebody had recorded this uh, and uh, put it up on social media that only at the point when he starts speaking about the rushing mighty wind the atmosphere goes from calm to you know real powerful winds uh, upon the meeting okay just in just when he's talking about the holy spirit so these are just manifestations sometimes where you know god shows uh, his pleasure or his agreement to what his people are praying and uh, it was one such time where uh, you know they prayed for boldness and you know god gave them that boldness so what is the result of their prayer god answered their prayer so it also says that they were filled with the holy spirit they were spoke the word of god with boldness now some of features of the early church are listed out for us in the last section of this chapter uh, i would really request all of us to be ready to read the scriptures because in this class i think a few of our students have uh, 
repeatedly read and they're quite long passages so it's nice if we can share the responsibility and be prepared to read sections so i request uh, someone to go ahead and read please from verse 32 to verse 37. now the multitude of those who believe fear of one heart and one soul neither did anyone say that any of this he possessed was his own but they had all things in common and with great power the apostle gave witness to to the resurrection of the lord jesus and great grace was upon them all nor was there any one among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone has need. Has need. And jo Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, Le Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Yes, thank you, uh, Zeli. We notice here that the church continued strong. They were in one accord again because the instead of one accord, we see words like one heart, one soul. That simply means oneness uh, among them. And we see similar features as we saw in Acts chapter 2, where the church is strong. Uh, in, in uh, spiritual matters, so we see great grace was upon them all, uh, and uh, you know, great power. The apostle gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is all the spiritual aspects. There is great power. There is great grace, and we saw earlier that even in the natural aspects of caring, taking care of people, they were quite good. And the same way they are continuing, we see that nobody lacked among them, which just goes to say that whatever needs people had, uh, the, the leadership was doing the best that they knew uh, how to take care of those needs. And uh, again, incredible generosity to the point where people were, uh, what does it say, they were even selling their things to provide for the needs of the people. There were uh, uh, possessions that they sold to lay them at the apostles' feet. What is the meaning of that? The meaning is that they were ready to, to uh, provide to the church to meet all the needs of the church. So if, if it is something like a treasury of the church, uh, people were willing to give it to it so that the work of God can go on. So we see both the aspects or the spiritual aspects being so strong in the church, uh, as well as the natural aspects. Uh, so, you know, it's a wonderful church. It's a strong church. It's a growing church. And uh, it's revealing, reflecting the very heart of God. So somewhere there is this uh, glorious image of the church that we have right now and it's also a very rosy picture that oh i wish i was a part of uh, the early church that existed from acts 2 to acts 4 <laughs> because nothing seems to be wrong in this church right everything seems to be so beautiful and so correct but please hold on we'll go to acts chapter 6 and you'll see where there are people there shall be problems right so there are problems that the apostles need to solve so that there will arise challenges uh, when we work with people in the church uh, but it's it is the responsibility of the leadership to resolve it with the power of god and that is another wonderful testimony uh, of leaders that we will see so yes there will be challenges when you have to grow the work of god but by the power of the spirit by the wisdom of the spirit we need to see how to address those matters how to bring solution to the problems that may occur because we, we are dealing with people and there are all kinds of needs all kinds of uh, issues that crop up uh, and uh, luke will start to present 
more and more people as we uh, move ahead from here. So, so far, the uh, focus lights were on Peter. Suddenly, you know, spotlights on Peter. Then uh, Acts chapter 3, uh, John also comes into the spotlight, Peter and John, as if they were the men that the church looked up to. And now there's another introduction. They talk about, Luke talks about Barnabas. Okay, Barnabas, who is this? Um, uh, there's a small description about Barnabas over here. Uh, and Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, but commonly we will use the name Barnabas by the apostles. Uh, he was a Levite and he hailed from Cyprus. What is what is his personality like? Having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So you know, he was a generous Christian. That's what we understand. He was not just generous, but um, saying that he's a Levite also shows us that uh, he was, you know, sort of uh, uh, like educated uh, and uh, quite respected in the community. So you can think about all that. So here is Barnabas, uh, and the apostles are named named him Barnabas because he's the son of encouragement. So maybe by personality, he was a very positive uh, individual. Then another thing that you can add to this description is he was rich. Having land, it says, he sold it. So overall, <laughs> when we think about Barnabas, we think, oh, you know, a really um, respected man uh, in that early church is who Barnabas was. So there is an introduction about Barnabas, but you don't see too much, you know, beyond this right now. But uh, as we carry on, we will notice, uh, you know, how Barnabas will come to the spotlight. And then eventually, you know, the spotlight will move to Paul. But we'll have to hold on till such time. Uh, and uh, we'll see what really happens in Acts chapter 5. So maybe what we can do is, I'm thinking we can just uh, have uh, some thoughts and uh, some sharing right now and wrap up with what we have learned so far. We'll start with Acts chapter 5 in the next class. So yes, whatever has touched you, impacted you, you want to share, please feel free. I'll go ahead. Uh, so in Acts chapter 4, uh, we see, uh, I mean, in 3, we see Peter using the name of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 4, uh, there's a verse where they ask them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. And it, it just surprised me that they don't want them to stop preaching, actually. Uh, but they want them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. That That really stood out to me, like, it's not like they're against preaching. They're they're okay with preaching. If you want to preach something, if you want to do some miraculous signs, maybe they, I feel like they're okay with it. But only when the name of Jesus comes in, that's when they are not okay with it. And it's it's quite uh, scary to know, like they didn't really want to ban it or like you just stop it. So that makes me feel how important it is, how powerful is the name of Jesus, that there was one point that they really want to stop it. And uh, sometimes I feel like, sometimes we should just look deeper into the Bible. We got very used to this uh, in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. It's, it became a routine for us to say those words. And But sometimes we should just pause and think what we are actually saying and what's the far behind it uh, because we, we are being Christian for a long time and sometimes things just becomes a routine. Things just become like, hey, it's normal to say that. But there is a great part behind every words that we speak. There is a history behind, there's a reason and there's a there are a lot of struggles behind what we have got today uh, in the name of uh, under Jesus, through Jesus. So that just made me stood in awe, made me pause and think, okay, I should be I should know what I'm speaking. I should understand the power behind it. And I think it, it should apply for each and everything that we do, the worship, the praise, the words, everywhere uh, we should really try to 
get deeper into the scripture, understand the part behind it. Yes, uh, Jatina, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, they were against that name because it's it's not just like, uh, as I said, politically and uh, you know, religious uh, terms, it was a threat, threat to them. But we know in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against you know principalities, powers of uh, rulers of wickedness, uh, and so it, it's enlisting to us spiritual warfare uh, and uh, enlisting the powers of who are opposing us. So we know that Satan will try to oppose the work of God, no matter where we are and at what point we are. He just doesn't want us to uh, spread God's word. He will come against the work of God. Uh, and that's a given. It's just that how the uh, apostles and the early church sought God's strength uh, and uh, you know declared their dependence on God. They declared the word of God and they asked for more boldness to continue in God's work in the same way. I think we should depend so much on God. Uh, that's the only way to move forward. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any anything else uh, that others want to share? Uh, in verse 13, uh, they you now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Uh, that was something which struck me uh, because, uh, you know, we become what we behold and people also notice that. And, uh, you know, the background check, everything they would have done about Peter and John, oh, they are from this background. Uh, they are from that background, but once um, they started speaking, the boldness uh, and also the way they handled the situation, they knew that they were with Jesus, which which stood out rather than the uh, the background of uh, Peter and John. Yeah, just wanted to add that. Yeah, <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, that's uh, so beautiful. So the what made a difference to them is the fact that they were with Jesus beyond. Uh, any other credentials that they could have had. The fact that they were with Jesus made them bold and made them so powerful before the council. So that's that's amazing. Sure. So, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, John. Thank you, Jatina. Thank you, class. Uh, please continue to think about these matters and uh, let's pray and trust God to really impact us as we go through the rest of this book. So at this point, we are going to pray and close. And uh, I will request uh, Jatina to please pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class that we had. We thank you for the acts that you do through your people, Jesus. Thank you for taking up the cross for us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us this authority to use your name, Jesus. God, I just pray for all my classmates and pastor and say right now, as we teach, as we discuss, uh, as we uh, keep reading the scriptures, help us to apply it in our life, Jesus, above all, not just listening to it, but just putting every verse uh, into practice so that we can move powerfully for you down here on this earth so that uh, people will know that it's not the education, it's because they are with Jesus. It's not uh, their talents, but because Jesus is with them and they are with Jesus and they have a relationship with him. God, help us to reflect you more in a better way through our actions as we read this Acts. Uh, let everything be done for your glory. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jafina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. We shall meet next week. Bye. Thank you.